In 1961, Henri Matisse had a painting uh, that was announced to be uh, displayed in the New York Gallery of Art and this modern art museum, one of the largest in the United States. And this was a big deal because literally thousands of people would get to see Henri Matisse's art piece, Labato. And hundreds and thousands saw it, experienced it, walked by it, got to, to take it in. 46 days after this piece was hanging in the New York City's Museum of Modern Art, somebody realized and recognized that they accidentally hung it upside down. <laughs> can you imagine all of the people that walked by this art piece and said, oh, I can see exactly what he's doing here. This is so great, it's so abstract. This is so beautiful. And the whole time it was totally upside down. One of the fundamental differences between Christianity and every other religion all throughout history is that Jesus came and took every other religion and turned it upside down when he introduced Christianity. Because all throughout history, all throughout every other religion that has ever been a part of this world that we call home, it's been all about working your way toward goodness. If you can just put your back into it enough, if you can just row hard enough, if you can just figure things out, fix things enough, pull yourself up by your bootstraps enough, and then Jesus showed up and said, no, 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 that's, that's different than I, than I want to do things. I'm going to flip everything religiously, everything spiritually upside down so that I'll do all of the work that you actually need to do in your life. Jesus showed up and, and he said, I've come to, to do the work that you actually couldn't do. The Holy Spirit shows up and comes to work in us and through us to do what we couldn't do on our own if we were just left to our own. And last week we saw that this resurrection power, the, the power that raised Jesus back to life, the power that moved the stone away so that a living Jesus could come out of the grave, hello, after being crucified, is the same power that lives within us. Yes, there will be a day when our bodies are risen again to be with Jesus forever in heaven. And I'm looking forward to that day. But there's a day right now that the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is alive and well in us, there is resurrection power running through our veins, bringing, bringing life and hope and, and, and meaning and purpose into our life today. We don't have to wait until eternity for that. The Spirit of God is breathing hope into the dry bones of our life, into the things that are dead and dying in our life, those relationship issues that we have, the financial pressures that we carry, the, the difficulties that we have as parents in, in raising our kids and being empty nesters and all of the things in our souls and our life that feel dried out and hopeless, God breathes life into through his spirit. But it doesn't mean that our life, our relationships, our finances, our our souls are just going to be simple and easy and hunky-dory and carefree and easy-peasy for the rest of our life here on earth. No, the freed Israelite slaves still had to go through the rocky desert after they were delivered from slavery. The 12 disciples who lived and ate and shared meals and shared time and spent their life doing life with Jesus still had difficult lives, even when they were in close proximity with Jesus. One of the great obstacles that you and I have to listening to the Spirit of God, it's, it's actually not what you might think. One of the greatest obstacles to us listening and hearing the Spirit of God is our inability to believe what the Spirit says to us. It's not an inability to hear the Spirit. 
Each of us as followers of Jesus, we can hear the Spirit. There's nothing mythical or magical or mystical about hearing from the Spirit of God. We can hear from the Spirit of God through God's Word, through prayer, through worship, through communion and fellowship with others in small group. We can hear the voice of God from the Spirit of God. The biggest obstacle is not our inability to separate the voice of the Spirit from all of the other voices that are clamoring for our attention. One of our greatest obstacles is not our inability to understand what the Spirit says, as if the Spirit needs translating in our life because of some super spiritual language. It's not our inability to put into practice what the Spirit calls us to do, as if there's just some super spiritual standard that you and I will never be able to live up to. No, one of our greatest obstacles to listening to the Spirit is our inability to believe what the Spirit says is true about us. That's why we have a chapter uh, like Romans 8. It's a chapter that a guy named Paul wrote. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn over to Romans 8. And as you're turning there, I just want to kind of lay the foundation again and kind of set this framework and this tone for us because the book of Romans was written by a guy named Paul who was a follower of Jesus, but Paul became a follower of Jesus after working really hard to try to be good enough, after working really hard to follow the rules in such a way that he would be accepted by God. But then Jesus found Paul. And when Jesus found Paul, Paul realized that the fight had already been won. That by trusting in Jesus, Paul began to experience this transformation that all of his hard work and all of his fighting for righteousness and putting his back into it and rowing in the right direction, none of that had ever made the difference that Jesus made in his life. And so Paul wrote this letter uh, to this group of followers in the city of Rome uh, uh, who were surrounded by things that were constantly and continually working against them trying to really follow Jesus. You had pagan gods. You had uh, Caesar who said, I'm Lord, not Jesus. You had Nero who was blaming all of the Christians for burning the city down. And Paul wants these followers of Jesus to experience the fullness in everything that God has for them and everything that comes from following Jesus consistently. This is what Paul wanted for these early Christians in Rome, which is why he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 12, these words, so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Let's just pause there because Paul introduces this phrase that he said before, maybe in your Bible, it says, therefore, brothers, So then, brothers, and Paul is referencing back to because of the reality, because of the truth of the resurrection, because of the the reality that the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit brings new life into our lives, so then we're debtors. Maybe your Bible says we have this obligation. We're debtors not to the flesh, Paul says. We're not uh, indebted to this way of living by the flesh. This way of living is done and over and gone. Now, we have the resurrection power that brings us a new kind of life, a new motivation. What is Paul talking about? Paul's talking about this. For followers of Jesus, sin, the way of the flesh, is an option. It's not an obligation. We can still choose to sin. We still often do choose to sin, but we don't have to. Paul is making this distinction here, this delineation that apart from Jesus, sin is an obligation. Apart from Jesus, we're hardwired to sin because of our brokenness. Now, it doesn't mean that all people who aren't followers of Jesus, all they do is sin, sin, sin no matter what. No, you guys don't know. All I do is win, win. See what I did there? I Jesus juked it. Two of you got that. If the middle schoolers were still here, they would have been like, yeah. Uh, Paul is not saying that hide your wife, hide your kids. They're sinning everywhere. What Paul is saying is that outside of Jesus, there's no way we can escape this gravitational pull and weight and drag of sin. We are, in fact, enslaved to it. But as followers of Jesus, with the Spirit alive, In us, 
resurrection power runs in our veins. Sin is not an obligation anymore, Paul says. It is now in Christ an option. But let me just have an honest moment with you. I'm not gonna ask you about today. I wanna ask you about the last 15 minutes. Let's zoom this out. Are there any of us in the room here today who still choose the sin option? Maybe in the last year, I'm just saying, hypothetically in the last year, yes, of course we do. Why do we still do that? Why do we still sin if we love Jesus? Let me give you just a few options. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. This may not, this may not hit on your reason for still sinning even though that you, you love Jesus, but here's just a few ideas that may trigger something. Why do we still sin? Maybe because we're uninformed. Maybe you're new to following Jesus. Maybe you're doing something that you've done your entire life and never had any issues with, but now that you're following Jesus, you're learning this new life means new rhythms, means new choices, and what you thought was fine before, now you're realizing and recognizing, hey, God said, don't do that. Maybe, maybe we still sin because we're uninformed. Maybe, maybe second, we uh, still sin because we have bad habits, we have these bad habits that run so deep in our life that they're like these deep ruts in the road and we can try to get the tires out, but we get stuck and then we get out and then we get back in because how deeply engrossed, we're kind of like the sheep who when, when God pulls us out of the rut, then we take off and run, but because of the habits of sin in our life, we just jump right back in. Maybe we're like that sheep, maybe we're uninformed, maybe we have bad habits, maybe Maybe it's not either of those. Maybe it's just that we're weakened by our sin nature. Like we're not strong enough to consistently resist temptation. Like for my own life, when I get so busy, when I'm stretched so thin, when I'm not sleeping well or I'm stressed or whatever else is distracting me in my life, in those moments, in those seasons, my wife and kids, they get, they get my leftovers. They don't get my best. I get grumpy. I get frustrated. I get sideways. And I'm not required to get grumpy. I'm not required to get frustrated. And it's not, you know what, I'm, guys, I'm off the hook because I'm tired, I'm sleepy, I'm stressed. No, I still make the choice to get sideways. Maybe we're just weakened by our sin nature. Maybe, number four, we're listening to all of the wrong voices. Last week we talked about this. What we listen to determines what we long for. Maybe we're listening to the wrong voices. Maybe, maybe what's hurt in our life hasn't yet been healed in our life. Each of us has hurts and habits and hang-ups that Jesus invites us to give over to him. Listen, if, if you're still carrying those hurts, those, those habits in your life, you need to know that we have an incredible ministry here called the Restoration Ministry. where We're ready to help you hand over those things that have been holding you back, those hurts and those habits and those hang-ups. Maybe today is, is that day where you're asking, why do I still sin? And, and you just haven't dealt with the hurts. We're ready to help you in that. What we long for ultimately comes from what we listen to. So we may be choosing that sin option based on our surroundings, but the important thing for us to realize today is that we are choosing sin. We're not uh, obligated to it. It's an option that we're choosing. Now let me just, as an aside, let me just talk about addiction. Because addiction captions, captures our heart in such a way that it's no longer a choice that we make, but a response that we take. We have real hurts that, in our addiction, it means that we, we feel and experience obligation to that addiction. But the good news of the gospel says that by the power of God, these addictions, too, can be healed. There is no stronghold, foothold, that an addiction can have in your life that Jesus can't heal. But there's good news and there's bad news. Which do you want first? Choose your own journey. Good news, bad, bad news people? All right, good news people? Oh, the good news people won this morning. Okay, first service, good news. The good news is that because of the resurrection power of the Spirit in our lives, we can choose sin less. 
We can say no to the sin option more because of Jesus being alive within us. The good news also is that one mistake, that that the mistakes that we make, that the struggles that we have and that we carry do not define us, Jesus does. Bad news is, though, the fact that there is an option means we don't have any excuses for it anymore. When you said yes to Jesus, you, you lost that excuse. Yes, apart from Jesus, you can say, you know what? I'm only human. But the moment you say yes to Jesus, we lose that excuse, and we can't just say, you know what? I didn't have a choice. It's just who I am. No, that was an option that we chose to take. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Paul says, if, you, if living in the flesh is your reality, you will die. That's all sin has to offer. Deeds of the body, Paul is using this phrase to really capture the idea of sin, but what Paul is really saying is as we live by the Spirit, we choose the sin option less and less. And let me just say as a caveat, I don't think Paul is saying that good Christians don't sin ever. We're not going to become sinless, but what he is saying is that as we live by the Spirit, we choose this sin option less and less. There's a work that the Spirit does in our life that he'll enable you to choose the sin option less and less, to actually put put to death, not just put away temporarily, this idea of sin in our life. It's just what the Spirit does in our life. The Spirit doesn't just make you look and sound more spiritual. No, the Holy Spirit makes you more like Jesus, which is so powerful, this work of the Spirit in our life. Paul could have said so many things. He could have talked about how the Spirit informs us and shows us where we've been confused about sin, but he didn't. Paul could have said that the Spirit helps us know when something isn't what God wants in our life, but he didn't. Paul could have said, this is how the Spirit breaks bad habits and builds new ones. This is how the Spirit gives us the power to get rid of the hold that sin has on our life to build new rhythms in our life. Paul could have said, this is how the Spirit brings you strength when you're weak and and more probable to give in to temptation. No, Paul doesn't even say, "Here's here's the new voice that the Spirit is giving you to listen to. These are all things that the Spirit does. But it's not what Paul talks about here. What Paul focuses in on, this work of the Spirit that Paul is talking about, we can find it right here in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Paul gives us this distinction, uh, uh, this this idea, delineation of working for grace or working from grace. Listen, discipleship is not easy. It takes work. There's work involved in our growth like Jesus, but Paul doesn't talk about this theology of work, of the spirit of informing us or strengthening us or giving us a new voice or breaking habits. Paul says the spirit brings us a new identity in a way Paul says, I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. And so what that means is when you said yes to Jesus, you received adoption as a son or a daughter of God. You didn't get a class to attend, a a badge to wear. You you didn't get a new deed or a new task uh, to your list of things to do. More than anything else, the Holy Spirit Uh, creates and affects this fundamental change in your identity from being slaves of sin to a child of God. Notice that Paul didn't say, hey, you were a slave of sin, now you're a slave of God. No, don't make the mistake that, 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 that you're a slave to sin and now you're a slave of God. No, you went from being a slave to being a child. You weren't just brought under the new ownership of a, of a different new master, a nicer, kinder master. That would have been a dramatic improvement. That would have been better than our situation now. But Paul says, no, that's not the way to think about it. You were a slave of sin, and now you're a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of God, and that is so much better than being a slave. Because as Paul says, 
Fear is the primary motivator of a slave. Fear is what motivates a slave to make sure that they don't break any of the commandments that their slave master gave them. They don't break any of the rules. They don't fall short of any of the expectations or somehow get on the master's bad side. That's, that's leadership by control. Fear is what motivates a slave, but not what motivates a child, or at least it shouldn't be. For a child, the motivation should be something other than fear. What Paul is saying here is so powerful. Don't miss it. Fear is not in the Spirit's toolbox, which means fear is not one of those things that the Spirit uses in your life to make you into the man or the woman that God designs you to be. Fear is not one of the Spirit's instruments. It's not one of his tools. It's not one of his resources. Can I go further? If what you're feeling is fear, then what you're listening to is not the Spirit. Let's just boil this down and make this uber practical. Think about it in your own life. Where in your own life do you feel and experience fear? Because that's probably the red area to the, or the red flag in the area of your life that you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. Maybe that high school senior who's worried about getting into the college of their dreams, or they've gotten into the college of their dreams and they're worried that they'll be able to make it all the way through without flunking out, without failing out, without messing something up. Maybe, maybe the fear is that, that single person who is worried that you'll always be alone. Maybe your fear is as a married couple, you'll, uh, you'll never get out of the relational dumps that you're in. Maybe for you, your fear is that you're drowning in debt and you never see a way out to financial freedom. Maybe your fear is that you'll never find a job that you actually like going to. But listen to me, the Spirit is not interested in using fear to shape your life. Fear can be a powerful motivator to compliance, but the Spirit isn't looking for compliance and control in your life. Why wouldn't the Spirit of God use fear in your life? It can be powerful. Fear might be a good way to force compliance, but it is a really bad way to involve someone in the mission. Fear might be a great way to get someone to follow all the rules, but it's a terrible way to involve them in the mission. The reality is God isn't looking for a bunch of people who just follow the rules. He's He's also not looking for people who are just going to break the rules. That's not my point. But God's ultimate, his ultimate goal is not looking for rule followers, but Jesus followers. If God had wanted people who just follow all of the rules, he could have made us a bunch of robots. But God was looking for people. And God is looking for people who are on mission with him, who are leading like his son, Jesus. In our family, one of our family values is being a family of gratitude. We want to live grateful not only to God, but to others. And we don't want to just be grateful. We want to express our gratitude. And so we didn't create a rule in our home that says, hey, you must say thank you when anyone does something for you, gives something to you, uh, or something that you ought to be thankful for. Now, we don't don't have a rule. We didn't back up this rule with, if you don't say thank you when someone gives you something, we're gonna take away whatever they gave you. I mean, it it probably would have forced some compliance for our kids because they were afraid of the consequence. But at the end of the day, we don't, in our family, we just, we don't want kids who just comply. We want kids who are actually grateful. We want kids who know what it means to be thankful. And by the grace of God, our kids are grateful kids. We haven't nailed it in every area of parenting. We're still figuring it out, but they're part of this mission, this value of who we are as a family, of being a family of gratitude. And what Paul is showing us here is that God isn't looking for compliance, and so he doesn't use fear, which means for you and for me that God didn't give us the spirit to keep us in line. God gave us his spirit to bring us into the family, and he did this through a change in identity. He did this in a change in motivation. This is why Paul says again in verse 14, for you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This is an interesting phrase. 
because the Bible wasn't originally written in English. It was, uh, the New Testament was written in Greek, and this is actually two different languages in one phrase. Uh, you've got the Greek word father, uh, which is the, the word pater, and then you have this Aramaic word for father uh, saying Abba. And, and I've heard some people suggest that Abba should be translated daddy or papa, but I think that could lose some of the original sense of the word because there's still this reverence that's not too overly familiar, but it's colloquial and warm. It's, it's this term of affection, which means that the whole idea is that the Spirit of God enables us to see God with affection. Paul says we cry, not just that we say, not just that we communicate, Abba, Father. We cry. It's this emotional word where something wells up within us that bursts out of us. It's not just a word that we use. No, it's, a, it's an emotion that we feel deeply. Ultimately, Paul is saying this. The Spirit of God brings us to see God with affection, not fear. The Spirit works in our life, Paul says, not primarily by new information, not primarily by, with, with strength to break free from old habits or some new voice that we listen to. The Spirit's primary work in our life is to see our Father with affection so that when we approach Him and address Him, we cry out, Abba, Father. So Paul goes on. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit, Paul says, bears witness, testifies. I'm from the South, and when I'm preaching in the South, it's different than preaching here in Southern California because when I, when I get going and preaching, sometimes somebody will say from the back like they'll say from the front, testify, amen. Somebody, somebody in the house today bear witness that the Spirit testifies on our behalf that we're children of God. The Spirit himself bears witness and testifies that we are God's children. What does this mean? The Spirit stirs our affection for God and testifies of God's affection for us. Did you know, did you know that God's affectionate for you? He's affectionate toward you. God has love and compassion and tenderness and care for you. Maybe you grew up thinking, well, God's just all-powerful, and he is. Maybe you grew up thinking or hearing that God is just holy, and, and he is. Yes, he's loving, but maybe if you grew up in a church environment or a home environment where fear was the primary motivator, it just kept God at a distance. I was talking with a friend a couple of weeks ago when we were on vacation in Tennessee, a friend in Florida, and and this friend was just completely overwhelmed, totally stressed out, overwhelmed with the weight of anxiety, depressed about this incoming hurricane in Florida that was just going to devastate things if you saw it on the news. This friend doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, but I shared the hope of Christ. I shared the hope of the gospel. And this friend told me something profound. He said to me, Brandon, I don't really doubt that God loves me, I just worry God doesn't like me. And maybe that's the sentiment that hits home in your heart and in your mind. Maybe you believe what Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And you believe all of that, but on some level, you kind of think to yourself, God has to love me. It's almost as if God doesn't have an option. You look at John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and it just kind of feels big and generic and not personal and intimate and affectionate. But can I just, can I be honest with you for a minute? If I'm being vulnerable and transparent, as a pastor, it is a whole lot easier for me to tell you and to show you and to teach you and to convince you that God loves you it's a whole lot easier for me to do that, to show you and teach you that God loves you than it is for me to believe it for myself. There have been times where I've felt like God just loves me reluctantly. 
I'm kind of hard to love because of all the ways that I struggle or all the ways that I mess up or the ways that I've disappointed God, the things that I'm still working on and in process in my own life. And so I begin to think, well, if God loves me reluctantly, then liking me is just out of the question. But my mentor, this has been uh, seven, eight years ago, my mentor Ken told me something simple and so profound. He said, Brandon, you should know that God likes you just as much as he loves you. And God likes you right where you are. As I read the Gospels, as I do every year, as I read through the story of Jesus, I notice that Jesus seems to like people. Not just the good ones, not just the religious ones. If Jesus disliked anyone, it was probably the religious ones, the self-righteous ones. But Jesus seemed to like sinners. He seemed to like those who were far from God. He seems to have genuine affection for the broken and the lost and the hurting and the hopeless and the addicted and the struggling and the suffering. Jesus has this way of showing us this simple and profound truth. God likes you. Like you. He likes you. Now, like me, that, that could be hard for you to grasp, hard for you to believe, but I just want to pour out this truth over your mind and heart today. God likes you. If you're struggling, God still likes you. If your marriage is a mess and it's all your fault, God still likes you. If you blew up on your kids this week, God still likes you. If you went back to an addiction this month, God still likes you. If one of your kids has left the family and the faith, God still likes you. If you've made a mess of your finances, if you're deep in debt, God still likes you. If you've made unwise decisions in your life, in your week, God still likes you. Things are a mess at work because of the decisions that you made, God still likes you. If you can't seem to kick the addiction, God still likes you. If you can't seem to get past bitterness, God still likes you. Church, hear me say this loud and clear. God still likes you. I'm not saying that sin doesn't matter. I'm not saying that you shouldn't deal harshly with sin in your life. Of course sin matters. Jesus didn't die for something that doesn't matter. But Jesus died to pay the debt for your sin. Why did he do that? Because he likes you. You can't afford to let this transformational truth slip away. There's so many voices that will constantly speak condemnation and judgment and fear, but that is not in the Spirit's toolkit. The Spirit speaks to you this truth. God likes you. One of the hardest things for us to overcome in listening to the Spirit of God is believing what He says is true about us. God likes you when you're doubting it. He likes you when you're having a hard time believing that to be true because God likes you. So today, I, I want to encourage you and challenge you to pray, Holy Spirit, would you help me feel my Father's affection and love for me? God, even in this moment, would you stir up in our hearts through your Spirit at work this understanding, this experience that you care so deeply for us. Not because of some Bible, Bible verse that we've heard, but because of the Spirit working and moving to remind us that you love us and you like us. God, as you shape our identity as a chosen, pursued, loved, cared for child of God, with the Spirit work in those moments when we doubt. 
ask this in Jesus' name.